You're sitting here this morning, whether you realize it or not, you are involved in a great battle. There is a fight of faith going on. Day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment, you and I are assaulted by the forces of unbelief. Whether that be our own lying hearts or the insinuations of Satan, the great liar himself, we are constantly involved in a struggle. Will we believe the word of God, trust in what he has said to us, or will we, like Eve, fall prey to Satan's lies? This is the great battle, and it is raging right now. As we open the word of God together and we begin to preach from the word of God, there's a tug of war going on. Will you pay attention? Will you fight to overcome the conflicting thoughts? Will you give yourself in faith to what God has said? In order to aid us in this struggle, the scriptures are constantly teaching, constantly teaching by both direct instruction and by illustration that the God of the Bible is supremely powerful over all. And he is worthy to be trusted, to be obeyed, and to be worshipped. We see this reality in God's words to his ancient people, Israel, in the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 46, actually, and you can turn there if you'd like, or you may listen as I read. But in Isaiah 46, we have a situation where the prophet is speaking prophetically about events yet to come concerning the Babylonian captivity and then the fall of Babylon to the forces of the, of the Persians under Cyrus, their king. 175 years before he's even born. But in this section in Isaiah 46 and verses 1 through 11, God sets up a comparison for us, for his ancient people. And it's this, that the Babylonians had to carry their gods, but God carries his people. Listen as the prophet speaks. Bel has bowed down, Nebo stoops over. These are the gods of Babylon. Their images are consigned to the beasts and the cattle. The things that you carry are burdensome, a load for the weary beast. They stooped over, they have bowed down together, they could not rescue the burden, but have themselves gone into captivity. In other words, the armies of the Persians have taken away the very gods of Babylon. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, you who have been born by me from birth and have been carried from the womb. Even to your old age I will be the same, and even to your graying years I will bear you. I have done it, and I will carry you. And I will bear you, and I will deliver you. To whom would you liken me and make me equal and compare me, that we would be alike? Those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh silver on the scale hire a goldsmith, and he makes it into a god. They bow down, indeed, they worship it. They lift it upon the shoulder and carry it. 
They set it in its place and it stands there. It does not move from its place. Though one may cry to it, it cannot answer. It cannot deliver him from his distress. Remember this and be assured. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying my purpose will be established. I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my purpose from a far country. That's a reference to Cyrus. Truly I have spoken. Truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it. Surely I will do it. We find references to God's power as a recurring theme in the Psalms. The ancient worship manual of God's people, Israel, scattered through the Psalms is the continual reminder that that Yahweh is the creator. And he is not merely the creator, but he is also the protector and the sustainer of his ancient people, Israel. For example, Psalm 121, the psalmist writes, I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. An emphasis on the power of God to provide and to protect his people. Our text before us this morning found in Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 3. Looking at verses 20 and 21, the doxology that ends this section of the letter emphasizes these same themes, that God is all-powerful, and that he provides and protects his people. Paul writes, beginning in verse 20, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, how big is your God? That's the question. How big is your God? Paul gives us a doxology here. What is a doxology? We use that term, but it's used only in these kinds of settings. It's not something that finds its way into into common usage. What is a doxology? Well, the word itself is is made by combining two Greek words, doxa, which means praise, and logos, which means an utterance or a word. And so a doxology is an expression or an utterance of praise to God, an expression of praise. They're found all over the Scriptures. In the Old Testament, there was somewhat of a common formulation for doxologies. And it would go something like this. It would would begin, blessed be the Lord. And then what would follow would, would be a mention of whatever the particular activity that the Lord had performed in the lives of his people. Let me show you this. 
I'm going to take you back to Exodus. Go all the way back to Exodus chapter 18. Let's just trace some of these Old Testament doxologies. Exodus chapter 18, verse 10. These spontaneous outbursts of praise for God. Exodus chapter 18, verse 10. So we have here the words of Jethro, Moses' father-in-law. So Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of Pharaoh and who delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. You see that formula, blessed be the Lord. And then for here, it's for the deliverance of the people of Israel. We find an expression over in 1 Samuel 25. There, it's, a, it's an expression of personal deliverance. 1 Samuel 25 and verse 39. Context here is, is when David was going to take vengeance upon Nabal for the massive uh, insult to him and his men and and the refusal of David's hospitality to them. And and Abigail goes out, you remember, and she she, um, makes appeal to David not not to do this thing. And David listens to her. But notice what he says here in verse 39. When David heard that Nabal was dead, you know the story, later Nabal dies, he said, blessed be the Lord who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and has kept back his servant from evil. The Lord has also returned the evil doing of Nabal on his own head. Blessed be the Lord who delivered me. Who delivered me. 2 Chronicles chapter 9 and verse 8. We have the words of Solomon. Actually, I'm wrong about that. It's the words of the Queen of Sheba to Solomon. Second Chronicles chapter 9 and, and verse 8, as the Queen of Sheba has, has observed all of the grandeur of Solomon's reign that God had bestowed upon him, and, and she says, verse 8, Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you, setting you on his throne as king for the Lord your God, because your God loved Israel, establishing them forever. Therefore, he made you king over them to do justice and righteousness. Again, God's power brought to bear for the benefit of his people. We find an expression of it in Psalm 28, verse 6. Here, a personal expression of David again. Psalm 28, verse 6. Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplication. Praise God, he heard my prayer. This kind of formulation we find also in the New Testament. This pattern finds its way into the New Testament, and that should not surprise us, for the writers of the New Testament and the the accounts they narrate are of Jewish people primarily. And so this Jewish kind of formulation, it's not unexpected to see it. And we we find it in, for example, Luke chapter 1 and verse 68. Luke 1, 68 Voiced by Zacharias, the father of John, whose last name is later called the Baptist. Zacharias says, verse 68 of, of Luke 1, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. We find Paul using the same kind of formulation in Ephesians itself, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. 
Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Peter, in 1 Peter 3, the same formulation. 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Doxologies were were common for the people of God. But they also play in the writings of the Apostle Paul kind of an important role. He frequently uses a doxology to to conclude a a section of his writings. When he's dealing with a a certain topic or so, when he he draws it to a close, he, he typically or often draws it to a close with a doxology. I can show you that in in Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Before he launches into his, his critique of them for their abandonment of the gospel of grace... He speaks to them about Christ who has rescued them, verse 4, from their sin, so that he uh, bore their sin so that he might rescue them from this present evil age and so forth. And then verse 5, to, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. It, it draws to a conclusion that statement about what Christ has accomplished there. And then Paul begins in verse 6 and he says, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting this gospel. There's a major transition of thought happening in this letter, and the the doxology indicates a movement, finishing one topic, moving on to another. You can see it over in Philippians. Philippians chapter 4, verse 20. Again, it's near the end of the letter, but it's it's the conclusion of a section in this letter where he's been talking about that God will supply all your needs. And verse 20 says, Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And then he Finishes the letter with the greetings. It brings to a conclusion, a teaching that he has brought to them. One of the classics is Romans chapter 11, verse 36, where chapters 1 through 11, Paul has, has presented his most comprehensive and logical, orderly Uh, explanation of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he he brings it to a conclusion here at the end of chapter 11 with a doxology, and then he will begin in chapter 12 to talk about the ethical implications of his gospel. So he closes the first half of the letter, the first part of the letter, and he says in verse 36 of chapter 11, for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory of forever. Amen. May it be. We see it in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 17, where Paul draws to a, conclu- to a conclusion here his section about how, in spite of his hostility to the gospel, that he was the, the least likely, as it were, to, to to trust and become a spokesman and an apostle of Jesus Christ. And yet God had mercy on him as an illustration that God's mercy can reach to anyone. And he draws that all to a close in verse 17. He says, now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So be it. Second Timothy, since we're there, we might as well... Finish out my little list here. Chapter 4 and verse 18. Here Paul is talking about the fact that he's at the end of his life. He's had repeated trials and, and basically all the believers have fled him and left him pretty much alone. 
And he draws it to a conclusion here. And he says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. May it be. May it be. So go back to the doxology here in Ephesians chapter 3. And we can now understand its purpose and place in this letter. Much like the doxology of Romans chapter 11 and verse 36, Paul's doxology here is drawing to a conclusion the first half of this letter. The first half of the letter. Paul has been, been teaching the doctrine of Christ and the church for three chapters. And he is now going to turn, beginning in chapter 4, with the ethical implications of that teaching. What does it mean to you and I who are members of a local communion brought together across all ethnicities? What does it mean for us? And so he, he ends his teaching before he begins to talk about what it means day to day in my life and yours with a doxology. And so this, this doxology is sort of a capstone for all that has gone before, and it's, and it's like a gateway or a door into all that is now to come. It serves this twin purpose. It brings together, it summarizes sort of the, 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 the teaching that has gone before, and it opens up the teaching that is to follow. So it serves this twin purpose. It's interesting as well, I think, that the, this uh, doxology that draws to a close, the, the first half of the book, uh, closes it in the same place the book begins with, with praise to God. Right? Chapter 1, verse 3, when it begins this teaching, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here he says, to him be the glory in the church to all generations. So it's sort of like bookends. It opens and it closes the great doctrinal section of this letter that we have spent many, many, many months exploring. Look at it again. Verse 20, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. The emphasis of this doxology is on the power of God. That's pretty obvious, I guess. It is about the power of God. Actually, Paul uses here in verse 20 three different but related Greek words that, that all come from the family of words that speak of power. They're not all translated power here in the English but the first one, uh, dunamai, is translated here in the New American Standard as able. Now to him who is able, dunamai, that is a, that is a power word. The next word is dunamis, which uh, is here translated power, right? The end of the verse, according to the power, that's dunamis. And then the next word that's translated works is uh, energeo. Like we kind of get the English word energy from that. So it's all about power here. It's God's power, his ability, his power, his, his energy. And what is it all directed towards? What is all this power here directed towards? What is it that, that Paul wants? He wants them and us to, to be able to grasp something. He is praying for the power of God so that you and I can grasp something. And, and what he wants us to, to grasp is the incomprehensible love of Christ that exceeds human imagination. 
And he emphasizes here the, the, the limitless nature of God's power. And he does it with, a, with this interesting expression, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly. Those three English words, far more abundantly, are actually one Greek word. And it's an interesting Greek word because Paul makes it up. Sometimes I make up words, but usually when I make up words, they're not real words. But the Apostle Paul uh, made up certain words that, that found their way into the Greek language. This word here that is translated far more abundantly Huper ek perisu is an interesting word that, that Paul combines together two prepositions, huper, which means more than, and, and ek, which means away from, and he, and he combines it with the common word for abundant, which is perisos, and he, and he puts them all together, and he comes up with this word, huper ek perisu, that now passes into Usage. It appears a couple of other times in the New Testament, but it's a rare word. And he creates this word because he is struggling for language to express the thoughts that he has here. This word stresses a comparison of, of, the, of the highest form imaginable. That's why he piles up the prepositions. Various English commentators and Bible translators are a grapple to try to get at this word. What, what is the comparison that, that Paul is, is speaking of here? And I think one of the best is, is when it's translated infinitely more than. So far more than, I think in that sense is under-translated. I like infinitely more than. Infinitely more than What? Infinitely more than, look at verse 20, all that we ask or think. Now to him who has the power to do infinitely more than all that we ask or think. In other words, we could say that the only limit on God's power is our own imagination. Let that settle in a moment. How big is your God? As you think about him, recognize that it is your imagination that sets the box around him, that limits him. But Paul's point here is not merely that God is able to do beyond what we can expect. But notice where he says, according to the power that works within us. In other words, the power is already at work. There's something going on. The agent of that power, Paul has revealed to us back in verse 16, is his Holy Spirit, right? Third person of the triune Godhead. He is actively working. In you, if you are Christ this morning, he is actively working in me beyond what I can even imagine, beyond any limits that I might impose. This is shocking. This, this is shattering to our teeny little faith. Remember Jesus, he speaking to his disciples in Luke 17 and verse 6, and he's talking to them about forgiveness, and, and they say, yeah, but, you know, if they come, if they sin against me, and they come, and they ask my forgiveness, and I forgive them, and then they do it again, and then they come again, and they do it again, and they come again, and they come like seven times, when, you know, when's enough's enough? And Jesus says, there's no limit. And they say, well, then increase our faith. His response is very interesting. 
He says, if you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. In other words, your, your faith is so teeny weeny. How big is your God? How big is he? Do you believe that he is powerful to do beyond anything you could ask or think? Now, this is probably as good a place as any to stop for a moment. Because someone could misunderstand what we have said so far. This kind of thinking, this idea that, that nothing can limit the, the power of God except my own limitations, my own lack of imagination, underlies those who preach the health and wealth, the prosperity gospel movement who will say that all you need to do is, is name it and claim it, and, and even some who, who would say that your words have power to bring things into existence, to enrich you. And so the idea that the power of God is available to you to, to make you healthy and wealthy and happy is foreign to the New Testament. In fact, Paul says over in 1 Timothy, chapter 6, in verse 5, he, he talks about men of depraved mind, deprived of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. When Paul says here in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20 that in his doxology that God has the power to do far beyond, infinitely greater than anything you could ever ask or anything you could even imagine for him, he is not speaking about him, God, making you rich at all. In fact, in the context of Ephesians, we can find exactly what Paul is talking about. That I don't speak of and can't even imagine the power of God behind. And I think when we review this, and, and what I want to do, and I'll do it quick with you, is to review the, what has been brought to us in the first three chapters. This is, the, this is the, the point to which the power of God is directed in Paul's thinking. And I think to be reminded of this is to, is to embolden us in our prayers. We're often feeble when we pray. Our God is not big. We don't ask big things, and we should. But we need to ask the right kind of big things, the things that bring him glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. So let's just quickly review here. God is able, in other words, powerful, to verses 4 and 5 of chapter 1, he is able to adopt defiled sinners as sons and transform them to become holy and blameless before him. Now you think about that for a minute. God is able to adopt me, a vile, wretched sinner, 
into his family as a son and to transform me to be holy and blameless. That takes a lot of power. A lot of power. God is able to gather all of creation together under the lordship of Christ and restore coherence and unity to the universe. Verse 10. The summing up of all things in Christ. Verses 20 to 22, chapter 1. God is able to raise Christ from the dead and establish him over all earthly and demonic powers. God is powerful enough to do that. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. God is able to make us alive and deliver us from our state of spiritual deadness and bondage to fleshly appetites and demonic powers. God is able, and God does. God is able to transform the trajectory of our lives from from self-gratification, verse 3, chapter 2, to serving others, verse 10, chapter 2, the good works that he speaks of. Verses 11 to 15, God is able to obliterate the ancient animosities between the ethnic groups, including the impassable barrier between Jew and Gentile. And he brings them all together as one new family of God. God is able to do that. Verses 15 through 18, chapter 2. God is able to eliminate the divine hostility towards sinful rebels and forge them together into one new man, intimately related to God as Father. As our Father. God is powerful to do these things. God is able. Verses 15, excuse me, 19 through 22. God is able to create a new spiritual temple in which the thrice holy God resides in spirit. Chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. God is able to enable you and I to joyfully submit to the Lordship of Christ in each and every circumstance. Powerful beyond what I can ask or even think to bring me into submission joyfully to the Lordship of Christ. God is able to enable you and I to grasp the exhaustively vast love of Christ for us, both individually and as a church. Far beyond what I can ask or think. Let me say it again. There are no limits on God's power except human imagination. Except human imagination. John Newton, Pastor, theologian, hymn writer penned these words in a a hymn in 1742. Great hymn. We need to, music teams, we need to find this hymn, find an arrangement that is singable for us. And I want to sing it. Okay? Where are you guys? I know you're out there. I saw your faces. This is your mission. I want to sing this hymn. 
It's called Come My Soul, Your Plea Prepare. That's the name of the hymn. And the second stanza goes like this. Thou art coming to a king. Large petitions with thee bring. For his grace and power are such none can ever ask too much. Wouldn't that be great to sing to each other? How encouraging. Or another one of my favorites from the children's ministry. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do for you. It gets at the same idea. The constraints on the power of God to accomplish his purpose in you and in us is our failure to ask. It's our failure to ask. Beloved, when you're tempted to throw in the towel and to say, I can't do it, you need to be reminded how big your God is. When we start here next week, beginning in chapter 4, with the, with the ethical implications and imperatives of the gospel, it's going to challenge us. And it'd be easy to, to cop out, to say, I can't do this. Where he says in chapter 4, 1 and and following, that, that we're to be humble and that we're to be gentle and that we're to be patient toward one another. And I can't do it. I can't be patient with that person. They drive me crazy. Your God is too small. Your God's too small. We're beginning in verse 17 and running all the way through chapter 5 and verse 14, this major section about breaking with the particular sin patterns that characterize the life before Christ. They're to have no place in the life of the follower of Christ. And you say, I can't. I've tried. And I would say, your God is too small. Because he is powerful to do far beyond what you can ask or even think. He can free you from the bondage of sin. If you're a child of God, he has freed you from the bondage of sin. Sin no longer is your master. And when we give in, we give in because our God is small. And we all give in. We all need to hear the message regularly. Because we all forget or we all doubt the power of God. Husbands, chapter 5, verse 25. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. I can't. I mean, if you take seriously the statement, you think about the statement as Christ loved the church sacrificially all the way, nothing held back. I can't. How powerful is your God? How big is your God, men? Ladies, to submit respectfully to your husbands. Can't do it. I just can't do it. If you had to live with him like I have to live with him, you couldn't do it either. You're right. In my own strength, I could not. 
How big is your God? How powerful is he? Can he do beyond what you can ask or think? Have you even asked? <laughs> Start there. Have you even asked? Goes on in chapter 6, talks about joyful obedience, children and slaves and masters. We would contemporize employers and employees and so forth. How big is your God? How big is your God? We need to be reminded that God is at work in and through us with a power greater than we can even imagine. It is the power of God that spoke the universe into existence. And God said, and it happened. This is our God. This is why the Old Testament reminds the ancient peoples over and over and over again and ties those ideas together. This is your God. The extent of God's power. We have also the evidence of God's power here in this doxology. And the evidence of God's power is the church. The evidence of God's power is the church. That's really a kind of a simple point to say that, but it's profound. It's deep. I mean, if you think about it for a moment, the, the very existence of the church throughout all generations is a clear and compelling evidence for the power of God, right? Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 18, that I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. The fact that the church exists today and not just exists as a small huddled group of believers but exists as a worldwide body of Christ is clear and compelling evidence for the power of God. The church is the masterpiece of God's grace. It is the place where he puts his glory on display most Fully. You see it over in chapter 2 and verse 7, where Paul says that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace. The surpassing riches of his grace. The church of Jesus Christ, born on Pentecost, persecuted and oppressed through the centuries. It is God's chosen instrument to protect and to preserve the scriptures as evidence of the power of God. Paul says in 1 Timothy 3.15, the church is the pillar and support of the truth. It is the display of the power of God. It is the church that was commissioned by Jesus Christ, to go out and to disciple the nations, to teach them all that he had taught, and to bring the nations under the lordship of Christ, right? Matthew 28, 19 and 20. It was given to the church. It is the church that is a multi-ethnic body. One in spirit, the very heart of the mystery of Christ. The church is the one new creation. And it is so valued by God the Father that he gave the very blood of his own dear son to bring it into existence and to sustain it through the ages. And as the church maintains its vital union with Christ through the power of the indwelling Spirit of God, it becomes more and more and more like the Father in its holiness. It defeats the supernatural powers arrayed against it. It fills the world with the good news of Jesus Christ and it 
grows numerically. It is a living, breathing body. This is the evidence of the power of God. And it abounds to his glory. To him be the glory, Paul says, in the church and in Christ Jesus, to all generations forever and ever. Listen, because there is never a moment when God is not passionately and powerfully displaying his glory, you and I can be assured that there is never a moment when he is not working to do infinitely more than I can ask or think in me and in us. The power of God evident in the church. And for how long will God display this power? To all generations, Paul says. It's been 2,000 years. To all generations, forever and ever. In other words, in the presence of the, of the triune God in glory forever and ever and ever, the body of Christ will be this testimony of the power of God. To give him glory. In the vision of John in Revelation, chapter 5, there in the throne room of God, we see the four living creatures and the 24 elders, and they fall down before the Lamb, verse 8 each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. He's talking about the church. Which is the evidence of the power of God. For how long? To all generations, forever and ever. Or in the words of John Newton, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. How long will the church evidence the power of God? Amen. May it be so. Let's pray. Our Father, we confess that far too often we see you as too small, too predictable, as impotent. We see you as a, as a man blown big. And we do not ask, and we do not expect, and we do not seek, and we do not knock, and we trust in our own resources. The prayer is a last resort. And much lays locked off from us. Our Father, as we finish this first half of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, in which these great and glorious truths 
about your sovereign power in election, in adoption, in union with Christ, in the exaltation of Christ, to his position as Lord of all, in the shattering of our sin, in the transformation of our nature, in the crushing of the ancient boundaries that separate people, in the creation of the one new man, and in the transformation by which we call you Abba, Father. The power of your indwelling spirit working in us to enable us to joyfully submit to the lordship of Christ in every single circumstance of life, even the most painful, most desperate, most grim. To gain a glimpse of the love of Christ which is beyond our comprehension. All of these things are, Father, we need your power to grab hold of. And then as we begin to put this theology into practice, to learn what it means to be patient with each other in a body where we're brothers and sisters, when we learn what it means to to care for one another, seek out one another's best, when we learn what it means to turn our back on, on sin, some of which claws are very deep, when we learn what it means to recover and to restore marriage to that great and glorious gift from the days of innocence, when we learn what it means to walk in the Spirit and to do battle against the forces of darkness. Oh Lord, we will be so tempted to give in, so tempted to fail in our own strength and then conclude it's not possible. And yet, Father, it's there that in a boldness of faith we need to wrestle, we need to, we need to grab a hold like Jacob, I will not let you go until you bless me. We need under the direction of your spirit to let our imaginations free that we might ask and keep asking for you delight to give. Oh, Lord, until Jesus comes, may you continue your powerful work in us. Amen and amen.